Welcome, everyone. Uh, why don't we get started with the Marin Energy Authority Board meeting for Thursday, February 2nd, 2012. Uh, we have a long agenda, uh, but I think you're going to find it's very interesting. A lot of good subject matter to cover tonight. Uh, in fact, Don, correct me if I'm wrong. We're televised Friday nights? Yes. Okay, so for those at home, you are in for a great uh, treat here as you spend your Friday night uh, watching us. So. Actually, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Good for insomnia. Exactly. Okay, so item one, swearing in of new board members. And I believe we have the pleasure of having one new board member here tonight, Ken Wachtel, who's a city council member with Mill Valley. Welcome, Ken, and if you could stand up. Okay. Actually, yeah, uh, Damon, me too, because I was provisional. We were wondering about that. Okay, Ford. <laughs> I'm Brother Ford. I'm Mr. Ford Green of San Anselmo. Okay, so Don, uh, why don't you do the honors? Space up, go slow so they can get it right. <laughs> so raise your right hand and repeat after me. Um, and when I say state your name, state your name. <laughs> I state your name. I, I can't or no. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do, do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend. That I will that support and defend, defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. State of California against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign, foreign and, and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. To the, the Constitution, Constitution of the United States. States. And the Constitution of the State of California. <clears throat> and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. That I will well, that I will well and faithfully. faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Very good, thank you. Now, our capacity as board members, uh, hopefully, is uh, better than our ability to have to um, repeat two words at a time. We can probably do four or six. Don, I know we have some special recognitions tonight. Uh, what's the timing we're looking at now? <laughs> yeah, we have, um, we have three very important folks that we'd like to recognize tonight. And we're going to start, um, if, if, it's, um, if uh, you're comfortable with this, uh, Director Connolly, that we will actually bump up item seven to um, happen at this point on our agenda. Um, so that we can honor our board member, Sean Marshall, who's been with us from the beginning. And he's Sean here. Yeah, sure. I, don't, I, I know what she looks like, and I don't think she's here. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we, <laughs> we'll wait on that. We could wait. I think we'd like to celebrate all three together. At the so same yeah. time. Yeah. So we'll keep seven in order. Sean is coming. She is coming. <laughs> Great. Item two, appointment of vice chair for MEA board. So. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, as many of us know, we've had um, Director Sean Marshall serving as vice chair of MEA. And um, because she is withdrawing from the board, we need to fill that seat effective this evening. And um, we are grateful that Director Sears has stepped up and expressed a willingness in filling that role. And so this evening, um, I believe we'd like to nominate and, uh, and confirm that seat for Director Sears. You're looking for a nomination or for a motion? Yes. Uh, um, nomination? I yes. nominate Kate Sears as vice chair of the year. Second. Second. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Item three, board announcements. Uh, and item four is public open time. Get the crowd tonight. Maybe you wish to be here at this time. Okay. Uh, item five, we'll hear from Executive Officer Don. Great. I just have a couple of items this evening. I know we have a lengthy agenda, so I'll keep it very short. Um, I'd like to welcome two of our new staff members who are here this evening for their first official board meeting. Um, and so I'm going to ask you all to stand up. That's all you have to do tonight. Um, first, we have Jeremy Wayne, who's joined us as a regulatory analyst for MEA. Um, we're really grateful to have you, Jeremy. Thank you for being here tonight. And we have Justin Kudo, who's joined us as an account manager for MEA. So really happy to have you with us. Thank you for being here tonight. And in two weeks, we will have our data analyst um, join us and uh, we'll be participating in our next board meeting. So um, we're really excited about having um, some new folks joining our team. And so far, um, they've been doing a great job. And I think it's going to um, be a, a great, um, great addition to our team going forward. The next thing I wanted to report on is the field trip, which was held on January 18th. And um, the slides that were flashing through when you all walked in were slides from that field trip. Um, it was a really interesting um, trip with a lot to see. We were, we were able to see some of the solar panels um, operated by the South San Joaquin Irrigation District, um, the Schultz Solar Farm. They had a um, couple of different technologies in place, and we got to see how they worked. They also had um, all of their solar panels were on tracking devices, so every four minutes you could hear the motor turn on and the panels would shift slightly to track the sun throughout the day. That was really interesting. Um, we also went up and visited a um, hydropower facility, um, which is known as the Tridam facility, and um, we got to walk across cross it on a, um, a swinging bridge, which was pretty exciting, and, and got some um, great shots and great views from, from that. Um, it was a very interesting facility that was built back in the 50s. So, um, And I should mention that they gave us as a gift a, a CD that um, was created back in the 50s. It wasn't a CD at that time. It was a you know, film. And uh, it, it's, um, it tells about the building of the facility with a uh, very 1950s style. It kind of sounds like the, the narration is uh, similar to the Superman movie. Um, so uh, really interesting CD. And there's there should be one um, in front of each of you uh, for the board members. We made copies of it for each of you to take home. It's the kind of thing you might want to enjoy at home with a glass of wine rather than here at a meeting. We were kind of thinking about playing it during the meeting, but um, decided against it. So um, take a look at that at your leisure. And if any members of the public would like a copy, let us know. We have a few tonight for the public. Um, but if you don't get one, um, you can talk to me or Jamie. We'll make sure you do. Uh, to, so thanks for those who participated in the field show. It was a great event. Uh, the next thing I wanted to announce is that we're going to be holding a WebEx conference on February 7th, which is next week at 10 a.m. for any uh, developers or interested parties who would like to apply as part of our open season where we'll be procuring power. Um, so spread the word about that. We've been advertising it through our distribution list to developers uh, and con contractors and brokers. And we also have information on our website about it. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. And that's it for my report. Great, thanks, Don. Any questions for Don mm -hmm. on our report? Chris, how, how's the response so far from uh, the open season? Um, we've gotten a, a fairly strong response uh, through RSVPs for the conference, and what's been uh, surprising to us is we're actually getting responses from developers outside of California. Um, we got some calls last week from Illinois and um, New York. Um, so I think we're going to have um, broad participation, and we're really looking forward to it. That's great. Yeah. Okay, thanks again, Don. Um, item six, consent calendar. Any discussion? <laughs> if not, I'll ask for a motion. I'll move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That matter carries. Okay, item seven, why don't we go ahead and um, skip over for now? Director Marshall comes. Um, 
Item eight, appointment of board members to standing and ad hoc. And this is kind of a carryover from the last meeting. Um, if everyone can take a look at uh, the proposed appointments for the various uh, both standing and ad hoc committees. One addition, actually a couple of additions on executive committee, um, Ken Wachtel, our newest director, has agreed to be on that. Correct, Ken? Yes. Okay, great. And on ad hoc rate setting committee, Director Sears will also be on that. So um, even if the names are in friends, um, those have all been confirmed as not only interested, but uh, consider themselves on the various committees, unless any mistakes that anyone sees. Um, just FYI, we need, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. We need one additional person for technical committee with Director Marshall with drawing. Um, if anyone has an interest in that, and again, that is kind of where the rubber meets the road for the agency. Um, a lot of the uh, technical kind of uh, real media issues get resolved there, so it is interesting. Um, I know there are a couple of directors not here tonight. I'm tempted to thank <laughs> <laughs> them, um, but I'll refrain at this time. Well, we will contact them, though. Damon, just yes. FYI, when does this committee meet? Technical. Oh, it's during uh, the daytime. It's, yeah, you know, Dick is our chair. 9 o'clock in the morning. No, all right. So, uh, I, there's no way. There's two hour, Dick doesn't meet. Excuse me, a two hour trip. So. All right. Yeah, although we are um, happy and have in the past adjusted meeting times of committees to accommodate the schedules of the members. You, so. you wouldn't want to do it around my schedule. Exactly. <laughs> 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 okay. And also, if I may, um, the folks that are listed here in brackets um, have all requested to be in these yes. positions. So I think um, it, I, I don't think it would be a problem to nominate them and, and confirm them this evening. Um, uh, but that, of course, is up to you. I, th I think that, that that's what they were interested in. Yeah, and I think, by and large, they're all here tonight. So why don't we uh, at least confirm the list here, um, unless there's further discussion, and we will reach out um, to the two folks not here about possibly doing the tech com. And Tom, keep in touch, you know, if you okay. see any interest in available. Well, I, it, the interest is there. It's just impossible for me to make daytime meetings. Okay. The operating room doesn't like it if I bail out. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any discussion of the list as modified? Um, how about a motion for approval? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <coughs> Nine, Green E certification. All right. Well, uh, what, uh, what we have before you tonight in, in the staff report is, uh, is what I consider to be a, a very high value, low cost opportunity for Marin Energy, Marin Energy Authority to and really enhance the, the value of its deep green product offering. Um, the, the Green Energy product certification has been used by many munis municipal utilities throughout the state of California as well as across the nation to provide customer assurances regarding the, the, the quality um, and accounting standards used in their voluntary green pricing programs. Uh, municipal utilities like the Sacramento Municipality District, uh, Silicon Valley Power in the Santa Clara area, uh, City of Palo Alto have all used the Greeny Energy product certification for their respective green pricing programs. And uh, the Center for Resource Solutions, which is the program manager for the Green Energy uh, program is a, is a relatively locally based nonprofit organization uh, located in San Francisco. Uh, they set all of the standards that are applicable to this program. And, uh, and really, this, this is a, a, a nice way to adhere to a nationally recognized standard and eliminate a lot of questions that may exist regarding the nature of the product being offered to our customers. Um, I, I, I mentioned uh, high value and low cost, I, I think it's, uh, it's worth noting that on an annual basis, the cost of certifying a renewable energy product such as Marin's uh, Deep Green 
energy products would be about $4,500. Um, after the beginning in the third year of the uh, pro program certification, there's a small volumetric fee that would amount to just a few thousand dollars a year. Um, and again, this, this provides MEA with the opportunity to use the Greeny Energy logo and, uh, and the Greeny Energy name in its marketing and communication <laughs> efforts. And with the, the, the upcoming program expansion in July, uh, I think this, this dovetails very well to pursue this certification at this time so that when we go out with our marketing and communication effort for the program expansion, that we can also fold in this uh, green energy product offering or product certification for our deep green program and hopefully recruit additional um, volunteers in, in that particular program. So the, uh, to, to date, what, we, what we've done, and I think it's important to, to note this, the Center for Resource Solutions, um, as I mentioned, the program administrator for the deep green energy uh, program also does individual product certifications for um, renewable energy certificates. So that, there's an important distinction there between a, a, a project that's developed, that's producing a renewable energy certificate like a wind farm or a solar farm and certifying that facility as being uh, compliant with the Green Energy Standard and then certifying a retail energy product like Marin Clean Energy's Deep Green offering. Um, here we're talking about certifying a product offered to customers. And so I um, just wanted to make sure that we, we point that out here. Uh, the types of assurances that are provided to customers by pursuing this certification uh, represent that the renewable energy provided to, to these customers is generated within the Western Interconnection or Western U.S., so regionally located projects. Uh, these projects need to be relatively new. They need to be uh, beginning commercial op operation on or after 1997. And then they also need to be, um, be delivered from a renewable energy fuel source such as wind, solar, biomass, and the like. And so by pursuing this particular certification, MEA would be committing to buying Green E Energy certified renewable energy certificates for its Deep Green program. And so, uh, again, very, very low cost. I think it's a high value. It comes with uh, the use of a, of a widely, widely recognized uh, logo. And if you go on to the Green E Energy website, you'll see the little Green E literally, and this is something that we'll be able to put on our product marketing materials and communications as, as just really providing that, that assurances uh, to our customers regarding the quality of this, this particular product. So what we're asking for you to consider tonight is, uh, is basically to approve staff submittal of the necessary registration materials for this particular uh, product certification. And I think what, what we'd have right now is an opportunity to certify the deep green 100% program that we offer and also consider certifying the light green um, product at, at this point or at a point in the future. Um, we're really not restricted in that timeline, but the deep green is what we'd be uh, potentially focusing on in the near future. So that's, uh, that's it. Any questions? Yeah, Kirby, on, on your, the second page of your summary, you're talking, when you're talking about fuel source, you say only renewable fuel sources such as wind and solar. But when you go over to page two or three, I guess, of this thing, it talks about eligible sources which include hydropower, biodiesel, how do those fit into wind and solar? Yeah, th those were just merely examples. And the, the biodiesel uh, and also the, the hydro, these are, are fuel sources that are also approved by the state of California for participation in the, in the state's renewable portfolio standard. So these are, are generally fuel sources that are uh, really universally recognized as being quote unquote renewable. So this is, uh, th these are just two examples of, of really a longer list of fuel sources that are, are widely recognized as renewable, non-carbon emitting or carbon neutral. Um, so under nature. some circumstances, we could be certifying a biodiesel as a fuel source? Well, we actually get to choose the specific renewable energy sources that we use to fill this particular need. So at present, we have only, uh, we have only bought wind and solar mm -hmm. recs um, to, to serve this purpose. So 
we really have full discretion in, in that particular matter. So there's no need to go on and buy biodiesel uh, renewable energy if, if that's something that the agency isn't interested in pursuing. Okay. Director Redcon. How does it, what is it called the Center for Resource Solutions is here? Do they have a whole staff that goes out all over the western United States to go check out every last wind farm, solar farm, and whatever other? I mean, how do they do it? Yeah, there is there is some of that that goes on, but um, th this process is largely handled <laughs> via submittal. Largely, of, I'm what? Is largely handled uh, via the submittal of, of necessary registration materials that um, can be can basically be reviewed relative to publicly available information about, regarding that particular facility. And so there's some cross-checking that goes on. Um, it, there, there are different registration materials that need to be submitted or prepared by generators as they're built. And so these are able to, you know, the Center for Resource Solutions is able to cross-check the applicant's registration materials against these publicly available sources. So that's, that's what typically goes on. Just as a, just a, in, how many people in this room have ever heard of Greeny before this report? I didn't see any of this. Yeah, if, if, if you're in SMUD service territory, uh, for example, like, like I am, you, you literally see this on a weekly basis in mailers and various communications from the utility. So uh, you get pretty familiar I with mean, it. I mean, you obviously get the tenor of where my questions are going, basically, is yeah. just, look, I've been living in the United States my whole life, so I've heard of the good housekeeping seal and all that. And, yeah. Know, okay. But I haven't heard of Green E, okay? And so I just want to know that, you know, that really means something. And obviously, we had almost 100% hands over there, so that, that, that was a good indication. You know, we, it, it's, it's nice to see. We do have a very uh, informed public. And <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't think that the public was just a random so yeah. and, and, and I, But, I, but I, I, I will, you know, certainly confirm that this is something that's clearly focused entirely on the energy sector, um, but yeah, it is nonetheless widely recognized. We're Director gonna, Green. And then we're gonna, <laughs> oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, we're going to have 90,000 90, customers here soon, or rate payers, and, you know, and I assume if the board approves this, it's going to have this little green E symbol on that, and so I want them to, that to be meaningful to all the rate payers. Correct. Right, I, yeah. I just want to confirm something. I guess it was harder to read it on the PDF on the screen, but this is only applicable to the green, uh, the deep green product. Well, it, it could be applicable to more than one product. But what you're asking for now is just a deep green. We're asking for the basically the to, for you to approve or or allow us to submit our registration materials to the Center for Resource Solutions for product certification. Um, we could certify one product now and another product later. Uh, we could. We could pursue both at the same well, what's time. The what's the proposal? The, the proposal right now is to submit these registration materials with it in mind that we'd be looking at the deep green program specifically deep in the near term and then over so a period a yes. of months, yeah. yes. Yeah, I think what's likely, we're actually still um, working with them to ensure that we can get both products certified, but it looks very likely that we can. And so the recommendation tonight is to um, allow staff to apply. And if we're able to certify both products, then we would probably- Yeah, but there's a pricing <coughs> structure in here is that only for the deep green? Well, the, the first product that you certify, that's where the $4,500 uh, applies, and then any subsequent products that you certify after that come at a lesser cost of, of $3,500. So that's a yes? Yes. Okay. One other thing I'd like to um, mention in response to Director Rifkind's question is that um, many of you may be familiar with LEED certification. This building, for example, is LEED certified. Um, one of the measures on LEED certification is to have um, a Greeny certified um, energy product um, as, as, um, your, as your energy product, and that will help you get points towards LEED. So just wanted you all to know that it's recognized also by LEED. Actually, if I could just add one more thing as well um, in response to your comments is that, um, you know, as I communicate with customers a lot, I do get questions from the public asking how I can verify and prove that we're really supplying the clean energy that we say we are. And, um, you know, we do have other reporting mechanisms right now, but there are two other public agencies. And so having a third party that's, you know, not, you know, not public and not directly associated with us, I think will give us a lot of confidence, will give customers a lot of confidence in what we're actually supplying to them. 
So I, I definitely see value in communicating that with our customers, even if they, you know, even if some of them aren't already aware of what Greeny is. Director Green. Briefly, are there any other programs that do the same type of certification that Green E does? Yeah, good question. Yeah, that is a good question. And uh, and, and really, not, none that I'm aware of. There are certainly, not, not for this specific purpose. Um, <coughs> There, there are other agencies that certify other things, but as far as uh, retail energy products are concerned, the Green E Energy Certification is, is, is really the only one that I'm aware of, and certainly the standard, if there are others. Answered my next question, which, which was, so given what you said, it is the standard in the industry now? Correct, correct. Uh, then the, I just have one other subject area. As, as I understood your presentation and using the materials, uh, the, there are two certifications that Greeny does. One is as to product, and the, the other is as to RECs. Correct. So, yes. Renewable, tell me the... Renewable energy certificates. Certificates, the, the certificates. And so the scope of what you're asking for now uh, has to do with certifying uh, our deep green and light green product, uh, but doesn't have to do uh, with certifying uh, the RECs that we get? It doesn't, yeah, we would have nothing to do with certifying the RECs. That's, okay. that's something that, that's a certification that's going to occur between the project owner, so the generator owner, right. and the Center for Resource Solutions. <clears throat> so that's something that, that's really out of our hands until at some point we may decide to, right. to own our own resources. Right, but that's, that, so for context, that's, that's what Green E does also, is to certify the validity of the RECs. Correct, yes. And, and by certifying the product, you're effectively pledging that you will buy these Greeny certified RECs. Right. So there's a, a, a bit of a marriage between the, the, the product certification, the entity certifying the product, and, and those that, that produce the RECs. Okay, great. Thanks. Any further board questions? Uh, Kirby, would you happen to know if uh, either of the state's major investor-owned utility companies, Southern California Edison or PG&E, uh, use the uh, Greeny certification at all? Not, not, that I'm, not that I'm aware of. Okay. No. I could be wrong, but I, I was under the impression that PG&E does Greeny certification. For a, car, probably for its carbon, uh, carbon offset program, which I think has now been discontinued. Okay, maybe that was. They, I, I, and I, I don't even know that they necessarily buy greeny recs. Um, it might also be confusing it with the climate registry. Could could be yeah. could be yeah. Yeah, there, yeah, and I, I think there has been some discussion within uh, at least one of the investor-owned utilities about creating a, a green pricing program. Um, but to the very best of my knowledge, there there is no greeny certified product uh, offered at present by the investor and utilities. Why don't we follow up on that issue just to sure. find out that's kind of an interesting comparison. Any further questions from the board? I, I, have, a, I have a comment. Yes. And I guess it's a confusion that I'm having. Ford, was, Ford had mentioned that this is going to be used to certify deep green and, and light green product. I think there's a possibility that that'll happen, but I guess the first proposal is that it's dark, deep green. And I would just <coughs> comment that if we do it for anything less than the full range of products, that we not do anything, let's put it this way, that we make it quite clear to the community that what is being, of what is being, we've got the certification for. And if we have certification for the deep green and we haven't yet gone for certification for the light green, that somehow in our marketing materials and the publication, publicity, that it's made clear that we're not misrepresenting what we have. And in fact, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great point you bring up. The Center for Resource Solutions actually, they're very clear about the communication standards that, uh, that, you, that you need to adhere to, and, and we, we couldn't do that. Okay. Yeah. okay, so just to make it clear, we're talking about deep green right now. No, I'm, I think we'd like to have leeway to apply for both. That way, when we begin doing our marketing for the light green program, that we could um, uh, use the logo for the light green product as well. So we're, we're still confirming that we're able to get that one certified. Um, but if we are, we'd like to apply for both. Yeah. So how much is that? Is that 4500 and 3500 
the first product certified will be 4,500. The second product and any subsequent product would be an additional 3,500. Um, and then how much on each subsequent year? It's it's that's just the initiation fee, so to speak. And Correct. Get a just just as as an example, uh, beginning in year three, so the the third year after the product is certified, there's a volumetric charge that begins to apply. And let's just say, for example, there was 10 percent participation at full rollout in our deep green program. That would be a, an annual cost, an incremental cost of $2,200 a year. Very very small. So you know, all, all total for the deep green <coughs> product certification. You know, you're, you're, you're talking uh, less than $8,000 a year. Do we anticipate in the future any other products or just two products like the deep green? Right, right now we just have the, the two products. But it is possible we would have other products down the line? I, you know, at, we haven't planned for that at this time, and, and, and I, I don't even believe that we've considered that, okay. considered that at this time. Yeah. Director um, So the cost is per, um, per source? Get per product. Per product. So it would be, so we have two right now, we do solar and wind? Well, it would be per um, kind of label, if you would. So deep green being one label, and then the, the second one being being light green. Okay. And so, so those, okay. yeah, so it's, it's per retail product, not per, you know, source of renewable energy or anything like that. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, I mean, Relatively speaking, it's it's very high value when you consider what you'd have to spend in, in terms of a marketing and communication budget in order to, to have the same bang for your buck. It would be well above eight thousand dollars a year. I've got one more. Yeah. Um, so the scope of the approval you seek is both for deep green and light green. It's anticipated that. Uh, Three years downstream, there's, maybe there's going to be 10% of our volume <coughs> will be deep green, and so the the volume metric charge will be predicated on that. What about though, uh, if we if we do the light green, um, won't the volume metric charge be commensurately much larger? And <coughs> have you looked at that and what your take on what that would be? Yeah, it's, it would be larger, but the, the volumetric charge only applies to the percentage of the, the retail sales volume that, um, that the, the greeny recs apply to. So I, mean, I didn't do a very good job of explaining that, but um, it, it, would be, it would be lower than, than you think. And, and there's, a, there's really a, almost a cap as, as, as far as we're concerned. Um, there's this three cent per megawatt hour, so a very, very low cost for the first 250,000 <laughs> megawatt hours. That's one quarter of, of MEA's total load at full rollout. That would be an annual cost of $7,500 if we okay. had to, to do the whole thing. So again, you know, even if we were to do everything, we're talking 10,000 bucks, it's not. Not that much is good enough for Not me. that much, yeah. yes. <laughs> good question. Uh, members of the public, any comments on this item? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. <coughs> Do have a motion? For uh, move to approve the middle of green DE energy product certification material for the Center for Resource Solutions. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that matter carries. Should we circle back to item seven? Yeah. Nah, let her wait. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Well, my son's birthday is already in the fall. It was legit. Yesterday. All right, well, welcome, Director Marshall. Uh, we will turn our attention to item seven, which is a resolution honoring MEA board member Sean Marshall. I'm going to ask uh, Director. Oh, Don, you want to? You have anything? Okay. Well, why don't we have Director Collins read the resolution? Okay, I'll do that. Um, and could we ask um, former Director Marshall to come up to the podium, please? <laughs> but before I do that, I just want to comment that. Um, this authority started with, with eight, eight directors um, 
actually, uh, Chris Martin was a, he gets a high five for his tenure at the beginning, uh, the founding, but then he left us in return, so I don't know how to characterize that, but uh, we'll set that aside. We had eight members. Um, there are four of us still standing. Um, the eight of us survived the border wars with PG&E, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably millions, and it's all an effort to defeat Marine Clean Energy's program and its, in, and its entry into the utility business as a competitor. PG&E lost in favor of the individual ratepayer's right to choose. I will say that when I came on this board four years ago, I didn't have any gray hair, and look what happened. <laughs> so, having said that, um, this is a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Marin Energy Authority honoring MEA board member Sean Marshall. Whereas uh, Marin Energy Authority is a joint powers authority established on December 19, 2008 and organized under the Joint Exercise of Powers Act, whereas MEA members include the following communities, County of Marin, City of Belvedere, Town of Corte Madera, the Town of Fairfax, City of Larkspur, City of Mill Valley, City of Novato, the Town of San Anselmo, City of San Rafael, City of Sausalito, Town of Ross, and the Town of Tiburon. Whereas the City of Mill Valley executed the JPA establishing membership in the MEA on December 2, 2008 as one of its founding members, whereas on January 5, 2009, Sean Marshall was appointed to represent the City of Mill Valley on MEA's Board of Directors as one of its founding directors. Whereas Sean has been a dedicated public servant and a strong environmental leader with lively enthusiasm and focused business sense, promoting a healthy community for over seven years in Mill Valley and for three years as a member of MEA's board, serving as vice chair during that time. Whereas under Director Marshall's advocacy and leadership, MEA launched California's first community choice aggregation, uh, that program on May 7, 2010, providing renewable, non-polluting energy to Marin County in order to help reduce damage in greenhouse gas emissions. And we did that. Whereas it is not possible to tell a full story of what Sean has brought to the board and to its mission, Sean is commended for standing tall and wavering against the winds of criticism and skepticism from many of our, in, many, uh, in our community who did not believe it possible or appropriate that the residents of our county would or should have its own independent electricity providing program and against the incumbent utility who spent millions of dollars in an all-out effort to defeat us. Whereas together with the late Charles McGlashan and other dedicated CCA advocates, Director Marshall was a member of the Marine Clean Energy Education Committee before MEA was even formed. She spent countless hours attending committee meetings, speaking out, and helped coin the name Marine Clean Energy, among other things. Whereas MEA's Board of Directors and staff sincerely thank Director Marshall for her passion and commitment to the agency, its goals, and its purpose, and whereas Director Marshall's dedication and devotion to MEA was exemplified through her participation and commitment to MEA's executive committee, its ad hoc committee, its contract and rate setting committees. Whereas Director Marshall tirelessly attended many, many community and industry events where she presented, educated, and advocated on behalf of MEA and the future of CCA programs everywhere, and she's still, still doing that. Director Marshall spent many hours in meetings and discussions helping to ensure the success of Senate Bill 790, thereby helping to level the playing field between investor-owned utilities and CCA programs. Whereas Director Marshall has always been a reliable team leader, generous with her time, and always offering a steady presence on the board with her objective analysis of issues. Whereas Director Marshall's colleagues will sincerely miss her love for all things CCA, her humor, her enthusiasm, and thought-provoking questions. Now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Directors of MEA that the board and staff do hereby extend to Sean Marshall our sincere and grateful appreciation for her dedicated service to MEA's board, our congratulations on her success as founder and director of Local Energy Aggregation Network, LEAN, and our best wishes to her for continued success, happiness, and good health in the years to come. You, you really have become synonymous with the agency's success. I mean, you've been through all the trials and tribulations, 
And what stands out, I think, to all of us is your perseverance, uh, your integrity in the way you've approached this, your vision, your courage, uh, your humor, as was mentioned. Uh, we needed that at times, for sure. Uh, and your smarts in, in just how you, you approach this uh, task. Uh, at all times, you've been looking out for your constituents in Mill Valley, but also really what's in the best interest of all Marin residents in getting this program off the ground. And more recently, you've really shown your entrepreneurial streak, uh, which is impressive as you get your nonprofit off the ground and you're off to a great start. Uh, we're certainly going to be cheering you on and also quite confident that uh, our paths will continue to cross. So best of luck in that. Okay, so we have some parting gifts. Do I get to say anything? You do. Is it, like a, minutes? Is it a crown? <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm egg time. Well, yeah. <laughs> now that I'm going to be sitting out here, I'm going to honor that three minutes. <laughs> So I just, I want to say thank you all so much. I mean, thank you is just truly not enough um, for a moment like this. And I was reflecting literally 100 miles an hour from my children's birthday party. So all, every parent in here knows how to juggle all that stuff. But I was thinking on the way up that, you know, you never know in life when something's going to come sit on your shoulder. Um, that at the time it sits on your shoulder, you don't really think much of it, maybe. Um, but I remember that when uh, then Mayor Chris Raker, who was representing Mill Valley in the early task forces for NEA, then it wasn't even NEA, then it was just this idea that it was a task force. And then um, Supervisor McGlashan took me out to breakfast back in <coughs> 07, I guess it would be, and started to say, you know, you're going to be the next one coming up the board, so let me, you know, let me start getting you up to speed on what's going on. And so I joined the CCA boot camp, just like you're doing now. And all of the other um, board members have already done and are unbelievably capable staff. And it took me a long time to get it. So for any of you folks out there who don't get it yet, don't worry, it's coming. Um, but after a while, I really began to understand what a game changer CCA is. And it's a game changer, not just from the perspective of uh, clean energy and greenhouse gas reduction, which has always been our leading rationale and our leading value in Marin, but it's a real game changer from the perspective of opening up energy markets, which actually drives price down over time. It gives consumers choice. We've all heard all of these arguments, but as I do this work more and more, I'm now beginning to understand the the true meaning of redirecting that economic dollar that has gone to large utilities and now is coming home to local communities. And you know we're seeing that here in Marin County, but I'll tell you in a minute what's happening around the country. It's pretty phenomenal. So um, it just has been such a pleasure to uh, be in this boat, sometimes feeling like there's a slow hole in the boat. <laughs> and then the moment that Damon said, don't blink until you have to, when we were sitting around that table. No, I um, think it was, don't blink. <laughs> <laughs> and ever th after that, I kind of walked around like, okay, okay, we won't blink. <laughs> and as I said before, you know, that first it was five ways to fail, then it was six ways to fail. And all of a sudden, you know, the tipping point started to get reached and, you know, really through the capable hands of all of you sitting at the table we managed to push through. And um, I do have to stop and honor Supervisor Charles McGlashan, who is truly in this room, um, who I think is so thrilled that there's a whole new class of fresh perspective. And um, I loved your question. I'm like, yes, there's going to be new good questions <laughs> on this board. So um, it's all good. So I just also want to just leave you with a really clear understanding that this agency is absolutely a national leader. So we sit here in this boardroom and, you know, once a month, little old San Rafael, but I'm telling you that the country is watching. And what is so pleasing to me, having served on this board, is that we set the bar high 
for uh, communities. There are 200 plus communities going to ballot for CCA in Illinois in March. I think the number is currently 220. <coughs> so our job now is to make sure that they're not just aggregating coal and mm -hmm. nuclear, that they are aggregating with a higher and higher percentage of clean energy, and that's starting to happen. And so we can say, look at Marin County, look at what they've done. You've got folks in the state of New York who are just watching, they watch our board meetings. I mean, it's, it's really no pressure or anything. But it's quite an honor to now be kind of um, in a different kind of front line, understanding that um, we really set a standard here. So I want to just congratulate you, Dawn, and all of the board for what we've been able to do and what you will continue to do. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity that this afforded my life. I had no idea. No idea. You know, I think you said it, Lou and Barbara. Who knew? We were just council members. Okay, we'll do this. We'll have our liaison assignment. We'll do it. Well, it was a total life changer for me, obviously. And I'm absolutely passionate about what we're doing in this room and what you guys do every day. And, um, and I have every confidence that we're just on the right path and there's still going to be lots of rocks that get thrown and, you know, you're not done yet. There are more rocks coming. And that's okay, because that's how we do it around here. And we, we prevail. So let me just tell you that um, CCA is on the move again in Massachusetts. There are upwards of 10 communities uh, circling around and looking at what Cape Light is doing. As I said, there are over 200 communities in Illinois. They expect an 80% um, success rate in that ballot initiative in March. They've got 20 cities already having aggregated in Illinois. In Ohio, 65 new communities coming online in 2012, including the city of Cincinnati. And in Rhode Island, it's also expanding. So um, it's a movement. It's taking off. I'm just so happy to be just a part of a great big team of CCA folks. And I will say that uh, Lean Energy is hosting the first ever national meeting, gathering of CCAs from around the country next week here at Cabala Point. I really hope that all of you will attend our party on February 10th. Mark Leno, Senator Leno, will be emceeing that event. And today, my colleague and I um, watched the first cut of our CCA, national CCA film. And it is phenomenal. And um, it just showcases <coughs> CCA from around the country. And the farmer out there in Delaware, and the woman up in New York, and why it matters, what we're doing, why it matters around the country. And um, so I really hope you'll come. And for those of you who can't make it, we'll come back and show the film um, another time. But it is being produced in honor of Charles McGlasher, who inspired me, <coughs> who inspired all of us, and really who we have to thank for sitting in this room. So God bless you all. It's been a treat, and I'll see you out here. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Agenda, but no, go for it. Yeah. Uh, Sean, it is right, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna do a heck of a job. By the way, do we have some refreshments? Yeah. Oh no, I've had it. Yeah, no. Sean, there's 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 some iconic individuals who are identified with an ideal, uh, an initiative, and a, and a proposal, something new, and I have to say, since I guess we spend more time uh, together than I, I think a lot of people. Um, being on the same couch, is that you have, you have lived that dream, you have established uh, yourself as a, a leader and a knowledgeable person. You've certainly taught our council and our community an awful lot, including your integrity in pursuing what you think is right and your, your dogged fight for what you think is right. And I have nothing but praise. For, if I had a crown, I would, I would, <laughs> I, I really have nothing but praise and admiration for the dedication that you have to something that you believe is so important and that is so important to you. Uh, I, I, I and when I talk about educating our, our community, you didn't actually tell us about 350 page uh, uh, packets, but um, I, I simply have to say that uh, Lean Energy is the winner for having you, and uh, unfortunately, MEA is the loser. For having me, but uh, oh, no, <laughs> uh, thank you for your time and effort and and your leadership. Thank you.
Any uh, further remarks? Yeah, I think. Only one. It wasn't wavering. It was unwavering. <laughs> Come on up, Sean, and also um, Lou and Barbara, come on, the three last years. And if I could make a few comments um, for our former directors, Thornton, Tremaine, and Marshall. We'd, we'd like to honor you with um, an award uh, for you all to keep and remember us by, and thank you for your passion, dedication, strength, and great leadership for MEA. You helped make this possible, and we are so grateful to you for giving part of yourselves to us. So thank you for all that you've done. It's a solar panel. Can I take a photo so don't move? <laughs> yeah, I can see that. <laughs> Let's pick it up with item 10, uh, resolution approving MEA property assessed clean energy grant, otherwise known as PACE. Uh, Don, are you going to get us going on this item? Yep. has prepared a draft grant proposal for a PACE program. And I think most of you are familiar with what a PACE program is, um, but just to make sure it's um, clear for everyone, this is a, a great opportunity that can be used to make energy efficiency improvements to a home or business um, and to make, um, uh, uh, to install renewable energy systems uh, such as solar on a home or business and put the payback structure onto your property tax bill. So this is a, a program that was launched in Berkeley a few years ago. Um, similar program was launched in Palm Desert, and a probably the most well-known program to date is actually in operation in Sonoma County. So we've been exploring this opportunity to do more energy efficiency and local generation through a PACE program in Marin County. And uh, in order to launch such a program, we would need some startup revenue and um, uh, you know, to cover some of the resource costs to get it up and running. And so because there's a grant opportunity, we've prepared a proposal, and the grant would be submitted to the State of California Strategic Growth Council's Sustainable Communities Planning Grant Program. And um, this, uh, this grant would be covering startup costs, and then the idea is once the program is up and running, it would be covered through revenue um, coming in um, through the program itself. We have worked with a number of partner agencies uh, on this proposal, and we're really excited about the opportunities to work with both financing partners and community partners that would be able to uh, participate <coughs> in the program. Uh, I'd like, as part of the overview this evening, I'd like to mention that we have some folks in the audience that we're going to be um, talking about again when we get to the energy efficiency item, but they've also submitted a letter of support and expressed an interest in being a partner with us on this grant proposal. This is the Marin City Community Development Corporation. Um, we have uh, Makini Hassan here and her team, and thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, if there are any questions um, for them on this item, 
um, feel free and, and we'll also be bringing them up to speak a little bit on the energy efficiency item. Uh, but we're really excited about this opportunity and um, I'm happy to answer any questions about it. Oh, I should also say that this grant proposal is due on February 15th and so um, we're kind of in the final stages of putting, pulling it together, um, getting letters of support in place. And what's being recommended tonight is that your board approve a resolution certifying the approval of the PACE plan so that we can submit it to the um, uh, California Strategic Growth Council. Well, Don, this is exciting. I know that uh, this has been our, on our radar for a long time um, and good to see that it's making this level of progress. Um, in the past, I know that the county of Marin has also been interested in, in this kind of program. Has there been some sort of understanding where MEA would now take the lead on it relative to the county? Or? Yeah, um, we were approached by the county a couple of months ago, and the, the county, as, as many of you may know, has been working with some of the other city managers through the city managers group uh, and looking at the possibility of launching a PACE program um, through uh, a, an undetermined mechanism, but just um, looking at some different um, structures. And when we, when we completed the um, adding the new members to the Marin Energy Authority in the fall and had the four remaining cities and towns join MEA, um, that was really the trigger for the county and the city managers to approach MEA and say, gosh, you know, um, now that you all are representing all the entities in Marin, it would make sense for you all to consider administering this program since you already have energy expertise, you have a storefront so you could actually um, work with customers and, and assist in that way. You also have um, connections with folks in the developer community and um, they really were looking to us to see if it's something we'd be interested in taking the lead on. The, the county and the um, participating city managers had also been in discussion with the Marin Community Foundation about the possibility of providing some of the financing for the program because as you know this, this type of program requires um, some financing to be brought forward from a finance partner and there is a possibility that the Marin Community Foundation would be interested in providing that. Um, but we have had some joint conversations with county representatives, uh, some city manager representatives, and the Marine Community Foundation to explore that option. Um, we've also had some conversations with private uh, finance partners that would be willing to work with us as well, um, whether or not the Marine Community Foundation is willing to come forward as a partner. So there have been discussions with the county, and just last week we briefed the uh, city manager's group at their regular meeting and um, they, they're very excited about our application and many of them are actually um, preparing letters of support from some of our member cities and towns that will be included in the application. Director Cromwell. Uh, Dawn, how optimistic are you, this is a grant proposal, <laughs> how optimistic are you of actually getting the grant money? And the reason I ask it, I think it was extremely unfortunate that this program was derailed two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be a very significant incentive for homeowners to say, okay, if it's not out-of-pocket money, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Uh, so are we reasonably assured of getting the grant, do you think? Um, I would not say that. This is going to be a competitive grant process. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that our, our chances on this one are not um, probably 50% uh, or lower. Uh, just because it's a limited uh, funding supply and there are a lot of applicants um, for this particular grant. I think it's also worth mentioning that there's another grant opportunity that opens up the day after this one is due, February 16th, um, that's um, known as the RESCO grant. This is a, a grant opportunity that we've looked at in the past and I think is an even better fit potentially for our application. So we'll be using this uh, basic standard boilerplate document um, and um, restructuring it to meet other grant opportunities that might come along. I think our, our chances on the RESCO grant are probably a little bit higher than 50%. But still there is a lot of competition for funding out there and so I think uh, we we certainly shouldn't um, anticipate, you know, make plans around this uh, funding coming through, um, uh, you know, until we until we hear back from them. Uh, I, I think it's likely to be a competitive process, so we'll just have to wait and see. And, and according to this document, once we do get funding, if we ever do, it will probably be six months to a year before we actually get it up and running for residential customers. 
Yeah, that's very typical with a grant is, um, you know, you have to first, it takes them a while to go through their evaluative process and um, to contact you and then, and then we need to go through board acceptance of the grant and develop a contract with the funding agency, get that contract approved. Um, so there's, there are several months of kind of um, waiting and then getting started and getting contracts in place um, before we can even then start planning the program. Uh, there are a number of planning activities that need to occur, occur before we can actually launch the program. Many of those are legal activities, so we would need to do a validation action, for example, uh, develop a lot of uh, legal documents. We need to have agreement with the County of Marin to place the assessments on the property tax bill, for example. So th um, those sorts of things would take several months and would give would mean at least six months leave time, possibly more, before we're actually offering the program to the public. And you think the federal government's going to get off the opposition line and allow these things to proceed? Yeah. Um, again, I, I would hate to speculate on what's going to happen on the federal level. Um, I think that to parse it a little more, what the way that we have structured this grant lines up with our <coughs> expectations on the commercial and the residential sector. What we're seeing is that the commercial PACE programs are continuing to go forward without any any hindrance at all from the, the federal activities that have been stifling the residential programs. Um, that said, the Sonoma County program continues to offer res a residential component and it has continued to be highly attractive to folks in the in the community. They haven't seen much of a slowdown in the request to participate even in the residential sector. So we're very interested. I think that our our community would really like to see a residential component, but what we've proposed in this PACE plan would be starting with a commercial program and giving that a six months t time to evolve and, and get up and running <coughs> and work towards identifying a partner that would be willing to work with us on a residential program and then launch a, re a residential program after <coughs> that time. That gives the federal process a little more time to play out and if we run into or uh, we see additional hurdles being placed on residential programs then we could decide <coughs> at that point to modify our approach. Don, question, uh, do you have a handle on who the competition will be lining up for the, these funds just in general? Um, no, I don't have a sense of the competition, although um, Rafael is here and has been looking at some of the applications from the past, have a se has a sense of who some of the successful applicants from the past were. Um, do you want to comment on that, Rafi? Or we might, we uh, might want to take a look at that and tailor our, tailor our letter in, in, in some way to... But. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, this is largely a planning grant, and so we've uh, tailored the language to be not just program implementation, but a lot of community outreach in developing and planning how the program would actually run. And there are lots of cities um, that are submitting the master plans or part of their climate action plans uh, um, most recently. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And most of them, um, the, the ones that were uh, receiving program money uh, in, in the first round uh, were primarily cities and communities with part of their master plans and climate action. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Don, um, in paragraph five of the resolution that is being proposed, it says the Marin Energy, the Board of Directors of the Marin Energy Authority agrees to reduce on, a per, on as permanent a basis as feasible greenhouse gas emissions consistent with the California Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. How, how are we doing that? Well, yeah, or, we're doing that in many ways, actually, beyond the PACE program. We're certainly doing that through our procurement and offering power supply to customers. Um, but I should, there's a caveat that goes with this resolution that it, um, in order to submit the grant, we have to submit this resolution completely unaltered. So this was, this was written uh, by the Strategic Growth Council, and um, this is their language. Um, but I think that we actually are in a stronger position than some of the other applicants, um, particularly on item five, where we're offering a product to, en to energy customers in Marin that is um, much lower in carbon content. But what happens if, what happens under this, if, I mean, we've made a representation, <laughs> what happens if, First of all, there's no timing or measurement or by when or as of 
Uh, what happens if we don't actually reduce the the, the greenhouse gas emissions according to this? What happens? Yeah. Well, they want the money back. What? No, that well, that type of provision, uh, if they wanted to include that, that would need to be in the contract that we sign. This is simply a resolution um, without, you know, direct recourse associated with. It's just showing that what our intent is. It's not intent. It's yeah. It, it, this is showing our intent. Intent. It shows our agreement. It's a representation, not a representation. So you're comfortable with this? Yeah, I'm comfortable with this. I I, I don't think it's um, overstating. You know what our goals are. It's not goal. Yeah, well, okay. that doesn't. Yeah, and I think that one additional comment. Um, so obviously, the the Global Warming Solutions Act is, is AB thirty two, and it's part actually of the mission statement of this organization to achieve AB thirty two goals. Um, so I think I would consider this sort of wholly consistent with our mission statement. Um, well, the, the, there is a difference between a mission statement and a goal and a, and a representation that you're going to do something. We can try as hard as we want and with regard to the mission statement, with regard to intent, and, and do our best. This isn't saying we're going to do our best, although it's saying that we're going to do it uh, you know, on as permanent basis, as feasible. I, I don't know if that, it's just, it's not a mission statement, it's an, it's an agreement in the contract. So I'm just pointing it out that if we're comfortable with that, I, I defer to you. It says that's feasible. Well, I know, but then that puts the burden on us to prove that it's not feasible. But you're, 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 you're making a representation that I will do something if it's feasible, and then it's my job to establish why it's not feasible. I don't know that we want to be put in a position to do that. But just. What's our content right now, Don, in terms of uh, greenhouse gas free? Um, let's see. Well, it depends on the product. Um, our, um, you know, for our 100% product, there are zero emissions associated with that. For our um, light green product, that's, well, 27%. Do you remember what the numbers are on that? Yeah, I, it's, I, I want to say it's in the, between 50 and 60% like mm -hmm. carbon-free. Yeah, 53%. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's the guarantee, and I think we're yeah. above that. Yeah, so yeah. we're above 53 Okay. But we aren't the, okay. We aren't the sole provider of electricity or power in Marin. Is this simply saying the power that we're gonna provide? Is that is that how we read that? Yeah, we're yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other board questions? Members of the public? Okay, good discussion. Um, call for a motion on item 10. I move uh, approval of resolution 2204, certifying the approval of the Marin Case Plan by our board, and also uh, move approval of the draft letter of support uh, subject to any final modifications by staff. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Matter carries. Uh, so I, Sears. Yeah, thank you. So I'm, I'm wondering if we might at this point want to move item 18 up and address that now. You know, we have a Twin City uh, CDC board member and the executive director here who uh, were had, had an interest in item 10, and I think they have an interest in item 18, and, and I'm expecting that we may have some conversation about the list of uh, agenda items on our various contracts. And I think it might be appropriate to move 18 up so we can get that done and they don't have to be here for the next three hours. Just a thought. I think that's yeah. a good idea. Sounds yeah. reasonable. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we move item 18 up to the next in order before item 11. Sounds great. I take care of my district. <laughs> good work. Okay, 
Great. So um, we're really excited about this item before you tonight because before MEA formed, we had a vision of getting more renewable energy flowing into the grid in Marin. And we also had a vision of getting some energy efficiency <coughs> programs up and off the ground and taking, using some of the revenue that's already collected from ratepayers uh, in our region and directing it into a local program that, that we could help set what the parameters are and make sure that it's really leveraging local, both local needs and local resources. So what we have before you tonight is a proposed energy efficiency program plan that we think is a great first step to get a really substantial program off the ground. This is a program that we might add to as we go forward, and um, but it's a, um, a program that starts off with really two t key components that I want to talk about. And I'm actually going to go up here so I can see the same thing you see. efficiency program plan is really based on some of the founding um, the founding vision that the MEA had. We really were aiming to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, and also provide benefits to customers by reducing the cost that they pay every month in, in their energy usage. Um, we've already done a few things to help with <coughs> energy efficiency, including the rebate program, which we launched last year at the beginning of our fiscal year and which we'll actually be talking about uh, a little bit later on tonight. We also participated at, by, in uh, legislative activity last year by sponsoring SB 790, uh, which was adopted in 2001 and became effective January of this year to strengthen the ability of CCA programs to administer local energy efficiency programs. And so um, there's, it's not a mistake that we're here at the very beginning of February with this plan. It um, really lines up with the legislation uh, becoming effective this year, and we're, we're excited to have our plan ready to go so early in the year here. Um, I'd also like to mention that there is, you know, in addition to MEA's vision and MEA's goals stated in our implementation plan, there is a legislative mandate that really gives us the authority to ask for these funds from non-bypassable charges, charges collected throughout the state from customers. Um, this includes Assembly Bill 117, which was approved in 2002 and enables CCA programs, and then also the, uh, SB 790, which I just mentioned. So the, the nuance with SB 790 is that CCAs are enabled to elect to launch a third a, um, energy efficiency program and uh, rather than apply. So it's a little bit of a different process, and uh, that's the process that we're following today. In order to apply, or I'm sorry, in order to submit our plan, we have to comply with uh, a few uh, parameters, and, and those are listed here. They're also included in your staff report. Um, but it, kind of to summarize, they need to line up with uh, state and CPUC <coughs> objectives and really provide some metrics to show that we're going to be um, doing, uh, using the funds cost effectively and for programs that will actually achieve results. So you'll see a lot of material in the energy efficiency plan that shows how we're going to verify performance and measure performance and make sure that um, the program is really being effective. So now moving into the program components, there are two elements contained in the proposal, the direct service element and the financing element. The direct service element includes a number of target sectors that we really want to uh, hone in on. The first three would be handled through our partners who are here with us this evening. And I, they, after I speak, I'd like to invite them to come up and add a little bit on, on what, what the plans are with this program. But we're really excited about their partnership. They would be providing a direct service element to convenience stores and small grocers. So these would be convenience stores, small mini marts, uh, sometimes little um, stores associated with gas stations, that sort of thing. And then there would also be a, a small sector target on restaurants. We have many restaurants uh, in Marin, so there's a lot of untapped potential there. And then the last sector that they would be assisting with is the multifamily units. And we're really excited about this. This lines up well with CPUC objectives, but also lines up well with, with really an untapped market uh, in the state and in Marin. We have a lot of multifamily units where there hasn't been a lot of 
um, energy efficiency done to date. And we're really excited about our partners being, being able to work in the sector because they've had experience doing this before. And um, it's also possible that some of the uh, job trainees that, that would be assisting with the program um, would have connections in, in some of these multifamily units and be able to really engage with the community. So we're excited about that as well. And then um, the next item on the direct service element is the enhancement to Energy Upgrade California. We've spoken with, with the board on the Energy Upgrade California a couple of times. We're actually providing some supplemental rebates to customers that participate in that program. But we'd like to go a bit further to expand upon this program. There's been a lot of marketing around it. The awareness really is building and we're seeing more customers start to um, request rebates and start to actually um, follow through with their upgrades. And so we're excited about being able to kind of leverage that momentum and, and do more with that program. And then the last item is coordination and outreach with the existing Marin Energy Watch partnership um, and also preparing for a transition because it's likely that at the end of the current funding cycle for the Marin Energy Watch partnership, which is operated at the county, that program uh, would likely be transitioning over to MEA. So we want to make sure there's a lot of coordination um, prior to that transition to ensure that there's a smooth transition and that we're able to maintain the same um, programs that customers are, are used to having access to. Now the financing element um, occurs kind of in, in alignment with the direct service element and it provides options for customers who are interested in doing substantial upgrades to pay for those. Often there's a, a steep upfront cost for doing a, an energy um, audit and, and an energy retrofit in your home or business. And so we would be offering um, a couple of financing structures that would help with that upfront cost. I should mention that the financing element programs would be targeted to launch approximately six months after the direct service element so that we can kind of do things in phases um, and, uh, and not, have, not start everything at once. But we're excited about having this opportunity. The first is the Property Assessed Community Energy or the PACE program, which, which I mentioned before, so I won't belabor that, but we're excited about getting that up and running. You, you will notice that in this proposal, we only focus on the energy efficiency portion of PACE. We don't talk about solar. That's because it's important from a regulatory perspective that we separate out the generation-related um, programs from the uh, energy efficiency programmatic uh, programs. And uh, this, this is something that has been a concern. Sometimes the investor-owned utilities get those mixed up a little bit. So it's important that we show a clear separation there. But our PACE program would be offered um, both for solar retrofits and energy efficiency retrofits. But the revenue stream um, coming through this energy efficiency program would only be for the energy efficiency side of the program. So that's why that's all, that's we, all that we're talking about in this proposal. The second piece of the financing element would be an on-bill repayment program for energy efficiency improvements. Mm -hmm. And um, this is something that the CPUC is very interested in seeing more of and something that we see as a real opportunity to um, provide an option to customers that's pretty easy. So customers <coughs> decide, well, gosh, you know, do I want to um, pay for this upgrade on my property tax bill or is it easier to pay for it on my, um, my electricity bill? Because we uh, already are processing charges on customer bills. We would be able to administer this type of program for customers. So we'd be looking at um, operating a program similar to other utilities that, that currently have this type of program in place. <coughs> and then the last piece is a pilot program providing a standard offer for energy efficiency procurement. And this is a concept that's used quite a bit in uh, New England markets, uh, New England energy markets through their version of the ISO up there and also in uh, the Texas markets. And so we've been looking at those models and what we found is that because this type of program isn't common uh, outside, well, it isn't common in California, we may be finding ourselves in a position of having to create a new market. And so because it's unknown how, um, how successful this would be, we'd like to launch it on a pilot basis um, and see how it goes and see if we're able to um, uh, successfully administer this type of program um, while making it um, a, a net positive program. So, but we're excited about it, and that's uh, a piece of the program that, that um, we're looking forward to including. So that's an overview of the program, and we're really uh, looking forward to 
uh, getting feedback from uh, the community and, and hearing uh, uh, about um, you know the interested folks that are that are out there wanting to participate. Um, and I'd like to invite our um, partners from the Marine Community Development Corporation to come up, Marine City Community Development Corporation. Um, if you want to add on. Thank you, Don. Um, I'm McKinney Hassan, the, Marin, the uh, Executive Director of the Marin City Community Development Corporation, and with me is our business partner, uh, Ray Thompson, uh, who is with um, Renewable Energy Management Solutions. Uh, to give a little bit of background on our um, proposed participation, our agency has been involved in energy training and workforce uh, support since 2007. And our recent experience for the last couple of years has been with contracts with the Marin Housing Authority. And those contracts have involved doing unit upgrades and improvements as well as retrofits and weatherization on uh, public housing uh, units throughout the county, not just Marin City, but at all the different components. So we've learned through that process uh, a couple of things. One, what the key uh, uh, what the key expectations are in terms of completing those projects and also having the opportunity to work with business partners which are contractors and uh, general uh, contractors that actually provide the opportunities and we've learned that uh, along with the occupational skills training that we do at our site when folks have a chance to get the on-the-job training experience and work with actual uh, businesses in the uh, in the field they're uh, better able to move into job opportunities and career opportunities and their training is actual training that is aligned with the actual needs of the industry. Uh, so we see the opportunity um, with um, MEA as one to expand that model, not only in Marin City but also in the Canal. And our focus of the training will, in will initially be around uh, the multifamily units where folks get a chance to work in their own communities and get this experience and also contribute to the uh, impact that residents have in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, the second part of this is actual job creation where as they move on to the other sites where there'll be convenience stores and uh, restaurants, uh, they'll have a chance to increase their skills and, and get actual uh, uh, work opportunities that will you know, support their careers. Uh, one of the things we're really excited about is there's a multifaceted impact of this project. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, active outreach and marketing of some of the opportunities that folks have for energy conservation because we're finding that there's low participation in some of those programs. So the increased awareness for many communities around energy conservation and participation in programs that make a, a difference and an impact will be uh, a great factor as well as the opportunity for folks to be engaged in the actual work that's, that's going to be done. All our work that we do, all our training, uh, is always done in the context of a business partner or businesses. Uh, we not only recognize the importance of occupational skills training that we provide, but also the experience of working directly with business partners who actually have to meet their bottom line and have to make sure that that training and that work experience is really authentic. And I want to introduce at this time one of our business partners, uh, Ray Thompson. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Ray Thompson. I'm the principal with REMS, which stands for Renewable Energy Management Solutions. And what we provide uh, are a broad array of energy efficiency uh, measures. Uh, we're a design engineering firm. Uh, we are LEED certified. Uh, we're a group of mechanical engineers. So we understand how things work, how they're designed, and how the integration of a design and energy systems actually work uh, together. Um, we have, you might ask, well, why did you choose these three uh, areas? Well, based on past experience working with uh, another utility company that I won't name tonight, that everybody knows, we, <laughs> we, we know that that provides the greatest impact for Marin County. Um, restaurants, for example, I don't, I don't have to tell you, um, they're extremely energy, um, an energy hog, intensive, um, and we feel that we can have a, an immediate impact 
starting with chain quick service restaurants here in Marin and then move to some of the uh, independent uh, type of, uh, of restaurants. Uh, multifamily, that's really an untapped market. It's been very difficult in the past <coughs> to reach. Um, it, and a lot of that had to do with the fact who was the owner, um, they weren't really interested, they didn't understand what was available in terms of service, what was in terms uh, available in terms of incentives, and in working with Marin Housing Authority and, and property owners here in Marin, we are very confident that we can, again, reduce those energy costs uh, in that market segment. And then the last um, area is the convenience stores, small grocers, gas stations, that's just, that's just a natural um, to do that. There is trends going toward using solar on top of the roofs. Um, maybe that's something to look at down the line. But initially, um, the energy efficiency is the quickest and most cost-effective manner to help businesses. Because after all, um, we want these businesses to reduce their operating costs. We want them to be hugely successful, make lots of money, and hire folks. I mean, that's, at the end of the day, that's um, our job. And happy to take any questions or that anybody may have or comments about our three segments, um, how we're going to, what kind of measures we're going to implement. I think Director Green has a question. I do, I do Ray, it's either for, for you um, or Don or, or both. Do you have any, my sense is about convenience stores and stores that are attached to gas stations is that they probably operate on a pretty narrow profit margin. Yes. And have, do you have any read, uh, or, or Don, do you have any read uh, about what the extent of the receptivity of those kinds of, of businesses would be to what we're proposing? Well, m my sense, uh, Mr. Green, is when talking, I think it's education. Once the owner understands what we're talking about, how it's going to help their bottom line, uh, I think they're interested. Okay. Uh, and, and, I, and I think, to step, to step back, I mean, I, I talked to one of the former board members on, on the, the cake break, and this business is interesting. Um, uh, it, it's, in the United States, it's a rel relatively immature business, and, and, and there's lots of information or misinformation out there about energy efficiency, and the customer gets confused. Um, education is the key, is the foundation <coughs> in this business. To answer your question specifically, it's taking the time to explain to the customer how his bottom line is, is going to change. They operate on a 1% or 2% margin. If we can reduce their energy cost 10%, what well, does that go to the, to the bottom line, straight to the bottom line? So the, ed the education is going to make the sale? I think so. One, once, these are business people. Right. If they don't have to do too much, they don't, they, they don't have to be disrupted, um, and you can show them that with a little change of behavior, then their bottom line can change? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And I think in significant numbers. Correct this is an educated, this is a very educated community. Um, look what you all have done here. It's an education process. Um, so I, I, I really believe that um, with the strong education emphasis and to the bottom line, how it's going to change their <coughs> business, their financial statements, income statements. I have a very complex question. That is, um, a certain amount of money is funded for this for these improvements, and it doesn't attach to the land, and the store goes under, and it's and it's based on their their payment of their electricity bill. How does MEA or the funding? How does the funding return? How do we get our money back? 
Yeah, I can. Question. Yeah, I can respond to that question. I, there are a couple of uh, different options, as as you saw in the financing element. So, um, if this was a uh, let's start with PACE. So if this was a PACE finance project, there are the current provisions that the Sonoma County program is using, we would um, want to use similar provisions just for simplicity for the customer. Um, and the requirement is that the, um, the assessment gets paid off at time of sale. So if the, if the property owner moves out of the building or sells the building, excuse me, they have to pay it off at that time. Um, for an on-bill repayment, I think your question may be most more directed a tenant, at the on-bill repayment. A tenant who's, who's leasing the building, for example. Yeah. There's, there, is, there are provisions in these types of programs run by other utilities that the um, full amount must be paid off at the time <coughs> you close your account. And that's something that you have to agree to as part of your contract. So, um, and that's um, that, you know, that's a provision that we would likely want to include. But if they're in but bankruptcy, we they're not going to be able to pay it. Yeah, these. I, I think it's also important to mention that we'd be working with a finance partner to handle that <coughs> contract, the nuances of the contract. So we would not be a party to that agreement. The um, this would be the, the finance partner, of course, we'd want to work with them to make sure they're offering a, a good, legitimate, solid product. So we're sourcing the financing, essentially. We're not, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's probably the, you know, if it's on title to the property, that's the owner's problem if the, if the tenant goes, because it's just a, it's like any other lien on the property. Tenant. But is it on title? It, the, well, the paces. We're talking about pace. The paces. The other ones aren't. Yeah. 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 Director Crow. I missed your comment about PG&E. They do have energy efficiency programs. You feel they have not been very successful, or what? Um, well, I'll take a couple of reasons. Um, one, there's seven service areas. They have about 350 employees. They, they just simply don't have the internal staff. That's why they have the third-party programs. Um, for outreach in just a wide variety of, of industries. Um, their goals, as, as I understand them, are to reduce their energy consumption by 100 megawatts per year for three years. This is information that I've gotten from my contacts within pg &E. And they just simply, it's not that they haven't been successful with these programs. Um, it, it's all about the energy that you put into the program. Um, if, if you have a, a good strategy, if you have a good partner, a good team, you're focused on, on what the goal is, these programs are very successful. And, and more than that, you can measure the success. It's not where the numbers that you're putting forth have not been verified. So some of the programs with pg and &E are successful, very successful. Um, others <coughs> have not. Has, but you, not do you think been. MEA potentially would be more effective than pg and &E? Oh, no question about it, for, for a host of reasons. One, one this county um, is, is, is very well educated. They get it. Um, <laughs> and keep in mind, pg and &E service area is huge. This service area, I mean, the sample size is, is smaller here. Um, but people, look, look at why are we here today? People, people understand it or we wouldn't be here uh, in this room today. Um, the programs that we've selected have the greatest impact in terms of energy reduction. That's our focus was having the greatest impact in the quickest, uh, quickest time. Director Athens. Um, Don, uh, Don, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly, but um, you know, I think it's really important that we need, keep, uh, we need to keep moving forward in a real positive light, and especially with the educational you know, component of making people understand. And I thought you mentioned that there might be uh, a point of sale you know, kind of an ass if there's an assessment, a lingering assessment, that it could be triggered at point of sale. So if that's the case, I would strongly recommend that you talk with the Marine Association of Realtors and try and get them on board because they are absolute death on point of sale because uh, there's so many things that affect sellers on the way out. 
So if they, they, I think they would come out very, very strong against anything if it's put in that light. So the biggest education might be with them, you know, initially. That's a great point. You know, we've we've um, this is different than a time of sale requirement, similar to some of the programs in Berkeley where you have to install mm -hmm. new toilets, you have to you right. know, install new windows when you sell your house. Um, but you're making a very good point that the assessment itself, even though the, the customer is entering into it consciously and has to sign to agree to that, it is an added burden at, at the time of sale. So um, you're raising a good point. I think that some of the, the federal issues that have come up are what is causing <coughs> Sonoma to require that at this point. Um, if those issues go away, then that would no longer be a requirement. And that actually was one of the things that everyone loved about the PACE program is that the improvement stayed with the property, not with the customer. And that made a lot of sense because the improvement happens at the property level. Um, but I think that's a great point, and that's something we'll, we'll certainly um, take that into consideration if we um, look at launching it at a, at a point where that would have to be a requirement because that may be a, a barrier. Good. Thanks. Yes, Director Green and then Director Watt. Um, Don, during part of your presentation, uh, you made reference to how uh, the IOUs have had a problem confusing energy uh, efficiency with energy generation and made the point that uh, it's important to keep those separate. My, my question is why? Yeah, um, and we'll get into this um, when, when we talk about regulatory items, possibly in more depth. You'll notice that this is a, a theme that we bump up against um, uh, pretty frequently. Um, in some cases, uh, PG&E will make an investment in um, solar, for example, and they will um, be using that to, to serve part of their generation supply. And then they will look to recover costs for that on the non-generation portion of the bill, which means that all of our customers are having to pay for that solar generation investment that pg e is making. Um, that doesn't make sense to us, and, and we have argued such um, at, with the CPUC. And in order to remain consistent, we wanted to keep a very clear line between programmatic non-generation items that, that will be activities that will be undertaking and um, activities that do result in generation. You know, I, I think we could make the argument that solar could fit under an EE program, um, and certainly many do make that argument. It might be something that we consider later, but at this point in the regulatory environment, we wanted to keep that, uh, those lines very clear. But in, in, in part, uh, so as to minimize the opportunities for customer confusion between us and PG&E and also minimize PG&E spreading on to our customers a burden that should solely rest on it in terms of, of charging. As I understood, you you were talking about the bill and allocating uh, some, some sort of cost and that was part of your rationale for having a, a really clear dividing line and you make, I, I think I heard you make a point about uh, how the confusion of that line is resulting uh, in MEA customers having to pick up PG&E costs. I think mm -hmm. I heard you say that. That is what I said, yeah. So, so I think there are, there are two different audiences here. Um, and the audience that I was referring to when I made those comments is really the CPUC. Okay. They will be receiving our plan and weighing in on our plan. So. For our submittal of a plan to them, um, it's important that they see what we're requesting a revenue stream for is energy efficiency only. Now, for the customer audience, what we're providing, what we would like to provide is a comprehensive program. The solar is something we still promote, but we do it through other means. We have a net energy metering tariff. Um, we have a feed-in tariff. We have other programs that promote local solar. And if, if we receive grant funding for the PACE program to get started up, then we would use that funding to launch the solar side of the PACE program. So to the customer, um, we want to offer both. Um, but to the CPUC and our request for energy efficiency funding, we want to keep it distinct. Thank you for clarifying the rationale. It helps. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions. One, this is an alternative method of getting funding for the PACE program as opposed to the grant that we talked about earlier. That's correct. Okay. And then I want to pick up on something that Dick says, and it's just created a question I hadn't realized. 
at least with regard to the PACE pro I know anybody can answer this. With regard to the PACE program, you are putting a lien on the property owner's property. In many cases, I would suspect that the operator of the convenience store, the grocery store, the restaurant was in fact a tenant and not the landowner. And so I guess the tenant has to convince the property owner to put the lien on their on the property that's going to cost him money, which he may not get back if the restaurant goes under. How does how, how does that work? I mean, or does it work? It, is, how do the landlords feel about these things when they're dealing with a tenant to whose benefit this is going to be? Yeah, I can make a comment on that, and then you may have some additional um, background that you want to provide. Um, but but certainly the property owner, if, if the PACE assessment is what was being considered, the property owner would uh, need to be involved in the, in the decision making. Um, really what it often comes down to is who is paying the utility bill. Mm -hmm. And the, I think that for many tenant um, where the tenant is paying the bill in a, in a commercial um, uh, setting, they would probably be more interested in the uh, on-bill financing approach rather than the PACE approach. And typically, these are set up such that the monthly payment on that financing is equal yeah. to or less than what they would have been paying in energy costs anyway. And so it comes out as a net positive. And so th that's really the goal with this type of program. The other parameter that we would include is that the, a minimum 10% reduction is achieved overall in the energy usage of the building. Otherwise, it's not really worth going through the, the process of financing. But it's simply another option. The PACE program is another option. I think the PACE program will probably be more attractive for the um, owner-occupied commercial um, facilities and for the residential yeah. facilities. Do you want to add any to that? Well, I mean, you, there's not much to add. It really depends upon who, who's paying the bill. I mean, that, that's going to be <coughs> really the key as to how you structure, whether it's PACE or, or on-bill finance. Who's paying the bill? Any other questions? How about members of the public? Yeah, Barbara. <coughs> want to say how thrilled I am that we are announcing the beginning of the energy efficiency programs for Morgan Energy. <coughs> it's just so wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm just thrilled. Thank you, Don, so much. And it's, it's really exciting to me that um, the pilot program for the um, um, standard offer is, is part of this. Um, this is something that uh, my organization has been working on since 2004. Um, and uh, you need it in the sense to do it, but, uh, but we're going we're gonna to give it a try here. And uh, I just, uh, I'm just really thrilled that this is going forward. I just can't tell you. I've had um, four, actually four filings this week, two of them in the energy efficiency world, one on financing and and another one, which is kind of bringing me back to where I began in the CPUC world, they're talking about shareholders' incentives for energy efficiency. This is where we're required to pay PG&E um, really protection money for uh, doing energy efficiency um, because they have a conflict of interest with energy efficiency, so they don't want to do it. CPC recognizes that they don't want to do it, and then they give them these big bonuses for it. And when you asked about, you know, how the utilities have been doing, uh, the commission has lowered their goals like three or four times in the last four years, just to make it easy for the utilities to make their, their goals and they still didn't make it. But the CPUC gave them $240 million of energy efficiency bonus, <coughs> even though they missed their goals. It's just outrageous. So this afternoon I was, you know, writing about, you know, why are we doing this? <laughs> we could have organizations that are aligned with ratepayers provide energy efficiency. People who want to do this, who don't have a conflict of interest. So I'm delighted that you guys are going to be working 
general concept. Gene, if you can say your name. Uh, Gene right. Dyer. I'd like to support the general concept of energy efficiency. I'm not sure how it works out in terms of competition with PG&E's program. I worry a little bit that PG&E has a combined program where it involves both electricity and natural gas. I know you're not getting to the residential area yet. You're trying to start with a, a smaller group. But when you get to the residential area, I think you'll find that if you don't include the natural gas as well, you'll be at a disadvantage because people will have to go through two different operations in order to get all of their energy efficiency. So I urge you to incorporate that as soon as reasonably possible. Thank you, Gene. Well, Ray and McKinney, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to working with you. Barbara, for your efforts throughout time on energy efficiency. I mean, for the newcomers who, who haven't met Barbara yet, our reigning uh, advocate of the year for MEA. We actually have a, a plaque in the office, and, and you were the first one to get that. So. Um, are there any other further uh, questions or discussion? No, I'd just board? like to make a comment if I might. I mean, I'm so pleased that we're going ahead with energy efficiency plans, and I'm really pleased that we have the CDC as a partner. Now, I always tell the story of a couple months ago when I toured the, the project in Marin City uh, that was for installing solar water heater, heater panels on the roofs of the low-income housing building. And it was, you know, it was a, a Marin County solar company. The young man leading the project had gotten an internship at that company and done a good job and then was given a permanent position. And now he was back in the community where he grew up training fellows that he grew up with in these new skills. And there is obviously the energy efficiency aspect and the cost savings to the residents of low-income housing. And I just sort of seeing it in person and the power of these programs. I mean, obviously we're not talking about solar, but I think the energy efficiency programs that we are talking about and the kind of benefits we can bring to our local businesses and the job training opportunity on top of it, I just think it's fantastic. And you know, I'm very familiar with McKinney's operation, and we couldn't have a better partner, so I'm just very pleased about the whole thing. Thank you. Right. <coughs> Would you like to make a motion? I think I'll do it. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. I thought that was kind of, that was a motion. <laughs> I would say, I would say. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Does that matter, Chair? Good job, stuff in the environment. Exactly. Local Aye. business. It's the best. It's and Director Connolly, could we actually take a second motion there to approve the resolution? Sure, so I'll do motion. that too. too I'll second that too. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That matter, Chair. Okay, item 11. Resolution approving second amendment to and restatement of confirmation agreement with Shell Energy North America. <laughs> this item. Um, is uh, it relates to the amendment to an existing power purchase agreement that we have with Shell Energy North America. And it's really to set the stage to, to uh, procure the power that will enable MEA to launch its phase 2B and complete the, the phase rollout, uh, which is scheduled for July of this year. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, just the overall structure. It's a set of agreements. It takes a little getting used to. Um, uh, many of, uh, uh, or some of, some of the agreements are not changing, so I'm going to highlight really what is changing. Um, we've included a whole set of agreements just for reference, uh, because you, you sort of have to read them together in order to understand them. Um, and then, um, like I said, I'll, then I'll, I'll, I'll point out what's, what's really changing here. So, I'm sorry? So, um, in terms of the agreement structure, uh, our current agreement with, with CENA, as we call them, uh, it, it follows an industry standard, which is a, 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 an agreement structure that's been put out by the Edison Electric Institute. And so it's a very common uh, agreement structure that's used for power transactions in North America. Uh, and the way it, it works is that there is a master agreement 
which really um, lays out standardized terms and conditions that are uh, associated with, with, the, with the agreement. And then there is a cover sheet to that master agreement, and the cover sheet is where uh, either changes to the standard terms are agreed to and documented, or in some cases the master agreement has options that can be selected between the parties and what they agree to in certain provisions. So this is where uh, those types of selections are documented in the cover. We're not changing either of those uh, documents. Those are the overall sort of um, umbrella agreement. Uh, the way that this works is that specific transactions are um, handled through a separate or a, a separate document called a confirmation. Um, and this lays out the, uh, the specifics of the product or service that's being <coughs> purchased and sold and deals with things like pricing and um, other uh, more specific details of the transaction. So uh, just talk a little bit about history. Uh, MEA and CENA executed the master agreement in uh, February, February 5th of 2010, and then executed the um, the first confirmation, which was for power supply for the phase one customers, um, and that was done March 18th, 2010. Uh, that confirmation then, when MEA rolled out to the second phase of customers, which was called phase 2A, which happened last August, um, the confirmation was amended at that time to uh, primarily to expand the volumes that were being purchased to, to meet the new load. Um, we made a couple other, other changes to the agreement at that time, but that's what we're operating under now. Um, and then the, uh, lately, if, as we've been planning the rollout, uh, we've been working with the uh, Contract Ag Talks Committee and, of course, with CENA to negotiate a, an amend a second amendment to the confirmation in order to, to take on the remaining load, the, uh, the Phase 2B load. So um, what's, uh, you know, primarily what's changing here is the, the volumes and new pricing. And the, uh, the new pricing that we've been able to negotiate, uh, although it is indicative at this point, it, it will be finalized when we're ready to execute. Um, but the new pricing is substantially lower than the pricing and costs that we're currently paying. Um, so this will, um, uh, this will enable MEA as part of the, the rollout of Phase 2B to actually reduce its rates, um, as, you know, primarily as a result of the lower pricing that's available for, for these additional volumes. So I think that's, that's the good news. Um, the, uh, the, the term is not changing, so the current agreement goes through May um, 6th of 2015, and uh, it, it would continue to, to um, terminate at that, at that point. So, um, the, as I mentioned, the, uh, what's changing is, is price. Price is not changing for the phase one and phase two A volumes. Those prices will remain as they are. Uh, we'll just have a new set of prices applicable to the new volumes. Uh, the, um, the, um, I, I just want to point out that the, the new phase two B volumes include all of the new membership. So this is the full expansion. That's, that's being uh, planned here, and that the power supply is being procured for. The, um, another change, and this is really um, a, uh, a structural change in the documents, is that the current confirmation includes the purchase and sale of capacity. It's called resource adequacy capacity. And what we've done in this amendment is strip that out and put that in a separate confirmation, its own confirmation. The um, Terms and, 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 uh, and whatnot are essentially just transferred verbatim. It's really just a structural change. Uh, the reason for that is that capacity is, is typically traded on a calendar year basis, um, and also our compliance. We have to, um, we have to prove out to the uh, CPUC that we have capacity, and, and our compliance obligation is on a calendar year basis. So we wanted to make sure that our purchases of capacity extended through the full year, the 2015, December 31, 2015, um, which is different than for the energy and the other products that we're buying, which terminates in May. So it's really, that's the only reason for, for stripping out the capacity into a separate confirmation. Um, and then the, the, the last area of, um, of, of what's changed are the renewable volumes. The, um, the, the current confirm has a, um, a varying percentage of renewables that uh, Cena 
will, will deliver to MEA. And um, what we've done in this amendment is to uh, set that at 27%. And so that is 27% of the California RPS qualifying renewable energy. And um, what MEA is doing, and as you've seen, you've approved some agreements, and I think there's another one on the agenda today, is MEA is, is uh, taking on more of the management of the renewable procurement um, in-house as opposed to you know, purchasing all the renewables through SENA. And so um, we're going to be setting the 27 percent standard through the SENA agreement, and then we're going to be moving towards a 50 percent overall renewable content through, through other agreements. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a change as well in the, um, in the confirmation. In fact, John, just to punctuate that, <coughs> what you're saying is our light green product will be reset to 50 percent renewable. Right. That is, um, and that's when we talk about rate setting a little bit later tonight. That is what we're. Um, that's what we're proposing. That's what. That's what we're moving towards. Exactly. So we would instead of seven to seven. Right now, our light green is 27 percent. Uh, we're, we're recommending that we change that to 50 percent, and then so we would just simply have a 50 percent uh, renewable product or the deep green 100 percent and keep it real, real clean and real simple um, for customers and really differentiate M MC serves to an even greater extent than what's available through the utility. Director Rick. Uh, so. Uh, First question, I'll ask, I'll ask all my questions and you can just tell at one time. How's that? First, why is the new Maybe pricing going to work like this? You know, then I'm going to not ask any more questions the rest of the night. So, why is the new pricing lower? And why um, can't we uh, get Cena to agree for the phase one pricing to, since we're rolling out all these new customers, can't we get them to? <coughs> kind of lower the pricing for that too, so we're over, yeah. because I understand that that pricing stays the same and we get a different pricing for this new phase, if I, if I understood you correctly. Right, that, that's correct. You're supposed so, to say now, good question. Yeah, I'm not gonna say that's a good question. Okay. <laughs> that's a great question. It's a, uh, <laughs> we had a, it's already an inside joke, so. <laughs> Even better than some of the other questions that were asked tonight. Um, the, uh, so, you know, the, the second part of your question about, uh, that's actually how we, how we did the amendment for phase 2A is we created a, a single price that was applicable to both phase 1 and phase 2A. We could have done that um, this way as, as well. Um, it, 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 it was just uh, a decision to uh, basically you know, keep things a little bit cleaner rather than have, having to go back. It's a, it's a little bit easier. It's a little bit more transparent for us when we're negotiating the deal rather to be able to look at what they're actually offering at current market and then validate that against our view of the market rather than having to roll that in with some older prices, which is going to raise the overall average and then figure out, okay, is this still a competitive price? So what we found, I don't think it, it makes a... Um, a material difference. I think it's it's more a, um, just a, a style difference. Um, but w we just find it's a little bit more transparent when we're negotiating this, just to focus on the incremental price rather than uh, an overall blend. <coughs> you know, because they're not going to give us the same. This they're not going to give us a current market for the old volumes. We already have a deal with them. Uh, the market's different now, and so if we were to um, work towards a single price for all the volumes, it's going to be higher than what we're facing for the phase two, phase two B. Uh, in terms of why prices are down, it's, it's largely, you know, I'd like to say it's because we're great negotiators. Um, I'll, uh, I, I'll have to admit it's largely a function of what's happening in the natural gas market. And since, you know, over, it's, it's just been a downward trend over the last couple of years um, in natural gas. So I think it, we're, we're a little bit fortunate in terms of the timing of our expansion. Uh, to be honest, uh, because um, although nobody can predict really you know, any commodity price, but there doesn't appear to be a whole lot more room for natural gas prices and power prices to decline. Uh, more, much more risk on the upside than there is on the downside. Thank you. Any other questions? Director Green. Well, John, looking at the Second Amendment um, to a restatement of, of confirmation. At pages six and seven, um, instead of the contract price there, there are X's. And 
Um, you've probably gone through this before. But, Trust me. Uh, there are confidentiality uh, issues uh, that have been agreed to with Shell Energy North America that causes us in a public meeting not to have the actual numbers that we're dealing with set forth or how come it's that way or this way? Yeah, the, the reason it's, it's X's and un, uh, not disclosed at this point is because the prices aren't set until the day we're ready to execute. Uh, so the way that we've handled this in the past is we've um, brought the essentially the form and content of the agreement to the board for approval, and then it's a, essentially a delegated authority to the chair and um, the executive director jointly to execute the agreement. Obviously, we would know prices before the contract is signed. We have yeah, indicative prices so. now, um, so you know we know where, where the indicatives are, um, but until we're ready to sign the deal, you know, that's when the, that's where the prices get filled in. At that point, it's, it's public information as well. So it's not a situation where there's a uh, confidentiality agreement where we redact prices from the agreement. It's just until it's ready to be signed. It's, it's really okay, and, then, and, so, and then, so this is being, if I, if I remember right, is being queued up for execution in April? No, no, so it would faster. be, it is, yeah, as soon as, you know, it, it could be any time that if, if the board approves the agreement and the resolution, then it, you know, it could be as soon as today or tomorrow or, you know, when the uh, chair and the executive director uh, deem it fits within the parameters. And can you give us just a, a rough idea of what the ballpark numbers are? That sure. So, um, you know, I'll give you a, a fairly wide range, but for the, the shape energy, which is just sort of the brown side of the equation, uh, it's in the range of between four cents and five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, our current deal, just by reference, ranges from five and a half up to probably six and a half or around there over the term. Okay. Uh, thank you. Sure. Director <coughs> Did we, um, I know that Santa has been the main oh, provider. I know I'm tired. I guess I have to ask another question. That's the way I'm going to keep this up. Right. So leave, me, leave me alone. So, uh, so uh, the, the CNA contract is what, what uh, has been the main provider, I understand, in MEA for a while. Did we go to open season, try to see if anybody else could compete with Shell? Yeah, what, I mean, we really um, have been working with Shell. What, you know, we, we essentially, since we have this master agreement in place, um, we, we uh, started with, with Shell first and uh, have been working with them on pricing and then just validating the, those prices against other market indices that we have. Um, so this was not the result. I mean, obviously we did a, a, an RFP <coughs> when we selected Shell and entered into the master, uh, but in terms of this confirmation, there was not a, an RFP process that was associated with that. This has been a bilateral negotiation between <coughs> us and C. I mean, the bottom line is, is I, you know, I know nothing about the energy market, I'm just asking. Do we get the best price we can? And you know, I know we're locked in Michelle until I guess 2015, if I saw saw that. And so that's all. That's yep. the, that's the yeah. We're we're confident that we're we're getting the best prices available. Uh, you know, we've we've gone down this path uh, with Shell and, and other suppliers and have you know compared their prices. Uh, you know, we've done that before. And like I said, we compare what Shell's providing us for for this confirmation with. Um, other there's there's a brokerage market that provides pricing reports and so you know we know where the we have a good good feel for where the market is we're, we're confident that uh, we're getting good pricing thank you further questions or discussion no one in the public